Welcome to Chat with Nomads, where we uncover travel insights, business advice, adventure stories, and lifestyle tips with world travelers and digital nomads. Here is your host, Rax, from nomadsunveiled.com. Hi, guys. Welcome to another episode of Chat with Nomads. Today, we have with us Simon and Carla from Sailing Ocean Fox. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start by an introduction of yourself and, of course, what you guys do. Okay, so uh, I'm Simon and this is my wife, Carla. And uh, we've been living on our 40-foot catamaran for over three years now. And uh, say we have sailed 26,000 miles. We bought her in Croatia uh, in, on the Mediterranean Sea. And we sailed her through, through the Mediterranean, across the Atlantic, uh, around the Caribbean, all the way across to Panama. To Mexico, Cuba, and then back across the Atlantic again to Portugal. Nice, nice. I'm very excited today to talk to you guys because I haven't met a lot of people that have been doing like the, the yacht life or the boat life and sailing around the world. So I was really keen to find out more about your travel adventures, basically any interesting stories that you guys have. It's probably a lot more stressful than people think, actually, because uh, kind of people think, oh, that must be a really um stress free type of lifestyle yeah. just sort of sitting around enjoying cocktails and looking at sunsets but um <laughs> not really like that all the time no. yeah. <laughs> we have those too you do get those yeah, yeah. but um these constant worries over unless you can afford to stay in marinas the whole time and, and you're staying out on the anchor but which most of us do because uh, that's actually the best place to be um, but there is quite a lot of stress over the weather, will your anchor hold if it gets really windy and things like that. So um, yeah. it is more stressful than you think, yes. Docking at Marines is the, is the natural option, right? But if you don't do that, what's the other option? Do you just like go the other option? There's three options. One is in a marina or, uh, or in a harbour where you're actually physically tied up to the land. Um, the next option is you can take a, a mooring buoy or buoy, as they're called, which is connected to the seabed. And uh, in certain places, you'll find those. You won't find those everywhere. The problem with that is that they will probably charge you for using it. And that could be anything from, say, 10 to $30 dollars per night. Mm-hmm. Or you just use your hook, your anchor and uh, lay it into the seabed and uh, hang off that. And normally that's very successful. Yeah, that's what we do normally. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's free, so that's yeah. uh, a good way to live because yeah. we don't pay to more than a yeah. But then you have the, tra- the stress of not having enough electricity or enough water, yeah. or, you know, so yeah. just things like that. I think we stayed at anchor uh, over 30 days in one uh, hit, if you see that. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to do the, the letter way, the last one, which is free and everything, then you've got to kind of pre-plan to have like the food and water and whatever on board the, on board the boat already beforehand. Yeah. Isn't the weather a concern then if you are not tied to land and then like suddenly there's a storm and you're floating around? Um, that is a constant worry. A constant, a constant worry, a daily worry. Yeah. Um, you don't go one day without checking the weather. And even in, for example, the Caribbean, which you think is a really nice sort of, uh, calm, placid place, they can actually get really quite rough there. Yeah, and sometimes you just go to sleep thinking that you're going to have a really nice night's sleep, but then you wake up in the middle of the night because the weather just turned, Mm -hmm. and then so you have to deal with that, so sometimes you have to be awake all night just watching if the boat's not going to hit other boat or it's not going to drag. So you need to be, you know, awake all night. So We we had a funny experience once of uh, Guadeloupe when... uh, we were on the anchor and uh, we went to bed and everything was fine. And it was a very, very calm night. There was no wind really or anything. And then I got up at six in the morning to make a coffee and I looked out the window and the island was just a speck on the horizon. And uh, we drifted off for about three or four miles. And in fact, what had happened was that uh, a big uh, commercial fishing net had slowly come down the coast and it got wrapped around our anchor and ripped our anchor out of the seabed. And, uh, you know, we us just, with this fishing net just yes. floated off into the horizon. And there we went. <laughs> oh, gosh, wait. But this sounds really 
kind of scary, right? Like, what if you guys didn't wake up, right? Like, do you guys actually kind of set some precaution or alarm whereby, you know, something will ring and then you'll wake up? You, you can get an app on your phone which uh, works off a GPS position and you can set into it if I drift more than 50 meters, say, or 100 meters, uh, then set an alarm. Um, but really, you get useful sort of feel of the boat. Yes. Yeah, and if anything unusual happens, you just wake up. You just wake up. Yeah. Um, and you uh, never, you never really in you know, a deep sleep. No. Yeah. You no. have just, you know, some sort of background. Yeah. Feeling, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <gasps> Wow, okay. That, that sounds a bit stressful when I hear you. I'm like, then you can't really get a, I mean, I, I kind of understand that you guys probably get used to it after like, you know, sailing for so long. But at the start, wasn't it like a, uh, was it difficult to get used to? Because, you know, you, of course, like when you sleep, you like to just go into a deep sleep, right? Yeah. And w w because our boat's a catamaran, it's actually very steady, uh, especially when you're in a, uh, uh, like a bay. Um, it's, it, it's very level. It doesn't really rock around too much. Um, if you're on a monohull, which is a boat with only one hull as opposed to ours, which has got two, um, they do tend to sway around quite a lot. Yeah. And, uh, that can be, uh, really quite uncomfortable in some circumstances. But even so, in the, in the customer, sometimes, uh, we get the, we get a little the, bit the movement, the movement, which can be irritating. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So going back to the start, what actually got you guys started to take this trip from like, what got you guys to decide to just uproot your life and go sailing suddenly? Well, we just got married in Barbados, uh, beginning of oh, January. That sounds romantic. Yeah, it was. It was very lovely. And we had all our children, we got two children each. Uh, or four children were out there with us. And uh, we're lying on the sunbed, sunbed, sunbed. And two days after we got married, Carla said to me, why don't we sell the house and uh, buy a boat and go sailing? Two days, yeah, actually correctly after two days after marriage. Yeah, it was just literally mm. like that. So that's <laughs> from there, the Simon just thought for a little bit. Yeah, it took me a little bit of time to get used to the idea because I'd been sailing before and I'd had uh, four yachts before, but I'd never uh, sailed that far. If you see what I mean, one journey overnight around about twenty-two hours was the longest I'd channeled uh, travel across the English Channel. So to think about sort of uh, sailing an ocean was really quite frightening. I think Carla didn't really understand because she'd never sailed before. No. <laughs> so we really don't have uh, any knowledge to base any fear on, if you yeah. see what I mean. Yeah. And, and literally that is how we, uh, we, we decided yeah. to do this. And then it was around about 15 months later we sold the house um, because we were uh, selling one house and buying another one at that point. And so it was about... 15 months later when we sold the second house and bought the boat and off we went and we never really looked back to be honest absolutely fantastic really enjoyed it got it so Carla then then that's the the curious question then is this right like because you were the one who proposed the idea but you have never really sailed before not for the long term at least so what got you to propose the idea in the first place um, so I, I always loved the sea and I used to have uh, motorboats so that was something that I really wanted to be around the sea and uh, going back to, you know, boat life. And uh, I just, I don't know, I just felt like we were there, we were happy. We should, we would have to make some changes in our lives because just, you know, keep going and working. And uh, I was really busy. I used to have five jobs, work 80 hours a week. So I just thought, well, let's do something. Let's make our life a bit more special and do something special for ourselves. Because so far we have been just doing what people, normal people do, you know, just work and raise their kids and then, you know, just the normal thing. And then we wanted to have a different experience. So that yeah, we wanted to do something special with our lives because we really just sort of been together for a few years. And... Uh, um, you know, we both had relationships before. We wanted this to be different and special and exciting. Yeah. And uh, we certainly achieved that. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. This is probably like, it's quite hard to beat in terms of excitement, <laughs> if you measure it that way, to be sailing around the world, right? Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Um, so uh, our route took us through the Mediterranean. And uh, after about five months, we were in uh, Gibraltar, at the mouth of the Mediterranean. And from there, we went down to the Canary Islands, then down to Cape Verde, which is another set of islands off the African coast down mm -hmm. in the tropics. 
And uh, from there, we did the, the big Atlantic crossing to Barbados, which was about 2,200 nautical miles, or about 15 days. Mm. Nice. So uh, you guys are always chasing the, the sun, right? Basically, you're going for the tropic and warm weather, right? Yeah, yes. it. absolutely. I promised Carla we would only ever have summer. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice, sunny all the way. <laughs> yeah. So when you guys started on the trip, was there ever like a timeline that, or was it like you guys already decided we're just going to do this indefinitely? Um, I think Richard, we were going to stay for about two years, didn't we? Yes. Yeah. 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 And so we've just done it for uh, just over three years. We are actually making a change at the moment in the process of doing that. But uh, just over three years, we've been on the boat. Yeah. Oh, that's quite long. And and now you guys are without a boat, right? As I understand, you sold off the sun and. We sold our boat uh, back in um, Spain about five weeks ago, mm -hmm. and uh, we're just in the process of buying uh, a very, very large barge, which is an ex-commercial barge, and we're going to convert it into a house which we can use on uh, the rivers in England and on the continent. Nice. Uh, but this change is more like just to go for... Another, because as I understand, this is bigger, right, than a catamaran. This boat is 156 feet long. This is big. Yeah. yeah, this is big. So, but this was not because you guys needed a bigger boat to sail a certain part of the ocean that is more rough, right? It's just trying to upgrade to a more... Oh, Carla got very seasick. Yeah, I get very, very ah. seasick in rough seas. So, when we go, like, like for example, when, when we leave to an ocean crossing, on the first two days, I'm just completely down, just really, really seasick. Uh, so I got a bit tired of that because it's been over two years and uh, I, I needed a bit of time. And also we have, the, our children are starting to get married and have kids. So we wanted to be around for a while, not for a yeah. just for So uh, my daughter's uh, uh, having a, my first grandchild in, in a month's time. So we oh, congrats. Yeah. So we wanted to be back here yeah. and spend a bit of time uh, back in the UK so that we can uh, see them and, you know, get to know the grandchildren, that sort of thing. Um, and it's not really an ideal place uh, to have a uh, catamaran and live on a catamaran. So that also sort of influenced us to buy a barge. But we never really thought we were going to buy just a complete shell. Uh, you know, this thing up until recently was shifting uh, aggregates, gravels and sand and things like that up and down the waterways in the north of England. And um, it's only just retired. The project is absolutely enormous. I mean, to start with, we're having the boat cut in half and 20 metres of the boat cut out of it. And then the bow stuck back on the rest because the boat is far too big. It's far too long. And um, it's a, this is a massive project and, and a really quite scary project, really. But equally, it's in, incredibly exciting. Yes. Uh, to be doing. Are, are you guys doing it yourself or are you getting like some professional help? Yeah, I mean, to actually physically cut the boat and weld it back together, um, we have to get that done professionally. It has to be done in the yard, in the dry dock. And, um, you know, the people do need to know what they're doing. Um, but once the sort of major metal work is over and done with, we're going to be doing everything else. So, yeah. yeah. So the interior and the, or the installation of parts and yeah, facilities. Yeah, things like... Uh, Hot water systems, heating systems, electrical systems. Um, and we're going to make it as um, self-sufficient as possible. So it'll have a lot of solar panels uh, generating a lot of electricity to run the uh, heating systems and things like that. So we can never be uh, totally sustainable because it's got an engine uh, to make it go, if you see what I mean. But um, yep. it, it's going to be as sustainable as possible. How long do you think the project will take to build up this thing? It sounds huge. A year. Oh, wow, yeah, that's long. Yeah, one year. I think the really goal good. is next summer to have it down here in the south of England on the River Thames. And um, mm. it just passes through the lock with 50 millimetres on each side. Cutting it quite close, no? Yeah. You yeah. yeah. like the stress, yeah. apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's going to be an amazing project. Um, it was something that's uh, going to give us something to do over the next couple of years, really and uh, get this thing absolutely looking good and smart. And it's going to have three bedrooms, three bathrooms, and a huge uh, uh, living room kitchen. Wow, sounds fun, actually. Yeah. 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 I'm curious about this 
are boats asset or is it a liability like when you buy it are you able to resell it at a higher value or is it like a car whereby you buy it you use it and then after that you're just selling it off second hand at probably a loss and then you get another one depends what you buy you need to be careful when you buy yeah. isn't it? it's buying is being very careful what you buy when you and how much you pay for it i mean our catamaran for example uh was uh, built by a french company called lagoon and they are one of the biggest catamaran uh, manufacturers in the world and uh, to be honest um even though we've done twenty six thousand miles in it we sold it for more than we paid it for, pay for it. oh wow so if you're strategic and smart about it you can actually you be can. a very good i mean i'm not saying you can really turn a profit you know by flipping mm. it although if you were to buy a boat uh, in uh, turkey or uh, montenegro for example and take it to the Caribbean and sell it there. If you bought it right, you would make a profit, I'm sure. Yeah. We have actually considered doing that. Doing that. Uh, but one of, one of the reasons we bought this specific brand, it was because we knew the resale price would be good. At least give us the same price yeah. we paid for it. Um, the barge thing is entirely different because yeah. um, you don't so much get them uh, by manufacture, you get them by type. Um, there's lots of different sort of types and styles, uh, but they could be made by all sorts of people. And some of these barges are a hundred years old. The one we're buying is seventy years old. Um, mm. So uh, uh, these things have uh, been around for an awful long time. I think we're paying probably the right price for this one. Although I'd like to have had it ten thousand pounds cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but but it's really interesting to know that you can actually like like buy a boat and. In some sense, you don't need to flip it for profit, right? Because if you have sale around it for like two, three years, and after that, you can still sell it off at the same price you bought it technically. So called your rental for the last few years are free. And that's, that's yeah. way, that's very budget friendly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are, there are things we did have to do some upgrades to the boat, uh, in order to take it across the Atlantic twice. But, um, you know, it, it, it relatively speaking, um, I think if you buy the right, Boat at the right price, you can get your money back at the end. Nice. Okay. So going back to traveling by boat, what are some of the advantages that you guys really see in living this lifestyle? Well, you get to go to the most incredible places, which you would never get to go any other way. I mean, for example, uh, we went to uh, an archipelago of 350 islands called Los Roques of uh, the Venezuelan coast. They belong to Venezuela. And uh, these were the most stunning islands. The waters were so clear and blue. The beaches were absolutely white and they were completely deserted. And yet you could have gone there uh, if you'd flown to Caracas and then got a little aircraft out of the Roques and then you'd get a boat out to the island. But um, having everything there, uh, you know, your freezer, your fridge, your beer, your wine, your food and everything. Um, yeah, because basically we take our home with, with yeah. us all the time. So we are... We oh. have, you know, we are self-sustainable, so we yeah. have everything. Yeah. And, uh, uh, absolutely incredible uh, yeah. thing to do. And you get a totally different, um, feeling about places than you do if you go on a package holiday. Yeah. If you go on a package holiday, you just go to kind of go to the airport, get transferred to the hotel, and you might go out on a tour or a trip. And the, the other thing is you get to know real people mm. from that place because mm. we have to deal with the normal things that mm. if you were living there, we need guards. We need to go shopping. We need, you know, we need to interact with the local people. So we get to know the people. Yeah. As opposed to the, the sort of tourist century type yes. thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The people that are, are in the tourist trade, which are all happy, happy, nice and nice. Mm. Um, so it's, um, it's a very, very different way of traveling. It's a very slow way of traveling. I mean, you tend to do around about 150 miles in a 24 hour period. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's slow and peaceful and, uh, yeah, lovely, really. Very, yeah. very nice. Yeah. You also have to deal with a lot of uh, officials because yeah. when you arrive in a country or an island, you have to go and see the customs and the immigration people and fill in all the forms and the ship's papers and stuff like that. It's not the same as arriving at an airport where you kind of flush your passport and they put a stamp on it. It does get a little bit. Yeah, and that can take from an hour, half an hour to uh, the whole day. The whole day sometimes whole day wow that's a lot of people yeah they are very slow sometimes and they uh you know 
they are not together. We normally have to visit three official places, oh. and uh, they are not together. They're not together. No. And, they might be and, right across the island. And obviously, we don't have a car, so we have to walk or get a transportation mm -hmm. or something. So you you arrive in a new place, you have to work out all these um, mm -hmm. logistics and uh, try to. But it's very very um, yeah. exciting to do. Yeah. Yeah. And you could go to the most out of the way places. I mean, for example, uh, we went to an area uh, called Boca de Toro in, in Panama. This is a sort of backpackers paradise, really. But, yes. you know, to go there by boat and be uh, sitting there and uh, going in. We have a little, um, what we call a rib, a rigid inflatable dinghy, which is like our little car, which we go from the main boat to the mm. um, key or wherever. And, uh, yeah, that's all really quite exciting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting to hear because I know I've spoken to someone who is like an equestrian, so she works with horses and every place she go, she tend to like to explore the country with horses. And then I've spoken to cyclists as well who are cycling around the world. And I realized that the, the travel perspective is very different depending on the mode of transport, right? Like, for example, the cyclist was saying that for most tourists, the main event is in the destination, right? When you get to a city, that is where you do your stuff. Whereas the journey between cities are like almost redundant, right? Because you're just taking a bus and, and that's not really the exciting part, right? But for cyclists, they see the, they see the journey between the point A and B being the main event. Whereas being in a city is not exactly like you go around doing the same stuff, but it's not the gist of the travel. So in terms of like, for both, I can see that you guys are also saying that's a very different vibe to it as well. Well, it took us um, 15 days to cross the Atlantic in one go. So 15 days at sea, we're not seeing anything. There's no, no, nothing out there apart from the water. It, it, it is absolutely fascinating. I mean, we do a lot of fishing and catch some big fish on the way. Carla's the uh, head fisher person. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You get into a very slow pace of life yeah. when you are out at sea like that. Yeah. Uh, things happen really, really slow. You have a, a big lack of sleeping during the nights, uh, so because you have to be on watch. Uh, so during the day, things happen really, really slow, so you tend yeah. to sleep a bit more during the day too. And then you finish, yeah. and then... And then you, have, you cook a meal. Yeah. And... Uh, watch a video. Yeah, watch a video or something. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but you have to be up all night. So we split the night into uh, shifts. We do three hours each. So we're on watch for three hours, and then we swap over for three hours. So you're never, you're never asleep together. Like someone has to yeah. be awake to watch. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> What do you keep a lookout for? What's the main reason for staying up at night? What are things to watch on? It's a legal requirement that somebody is on watch. Uh, we're looking for uh, ships or other yachts or possibly fish containers or whales or something like that, uh, which could you know do some harm to us. And also, we're monitoring the weather. The weather. If the wind turns, yeah. uh, we have to put sails down, sails yeah. up, change the sails, and you have to do something. So, yeah, have to be awake. <laughs> That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. So you tend to sort of sleep a little bit during the day as well, because yeah. you need to catch up on some of the sleep that you miss. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So you guys do it by three hour shift. So one will sleep for three hours and then you wake up. And yeah. Is there an issue with the body clock though? Do you feel weird because of that? Because that is obviously a quite an irregular sleep pattern, right? I think you, uh, it takes about two or three days to get, into, get the rhythm. Used into the rhythm. Yeah. 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 And and then you kind of uh, you go to bed and you go straight to sleep yeah. and then you don't really need an alarm. You wake up, you know, two or three minutes before you have to be back on board. You might you might not sleep those three hours because we have a very strict rule on board. If we need to go outside to adjust the sails or do anything else outside, uh, we will um, wake up the other one. So we have to. So no, no matter if it's sleeping or not. Yeah. Just yeah. Sorry, our, our cat's... Uh, <laughs> <Where is that? laughs> What's the cat's name, by the way? Bobby, as out of uh, Harry Potter. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what, that was what I was thinking. That's interesting. He's naked. And, yeah, that's what I was seeing. And he's a he, right? And he sails with you guys. Yeah. yeah. Is there any issues with the, the cat being on board? Like, do, does he react in some funny way during bad weather or something? He gets seasick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But cats just usually lay around all day anyway. He's very good, isn't he? Yes, he's very he, good. Yeah. You know, when we're at sea, he kind of knows we are, and uh, he spends a lot of time just sleeping. 
and, and not really doing anything. And then as soon as we get to land, uh, he's out there sniffing the air, trying to work out what it is because, you know, it's a different smell to him. He can smell the different islands and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that must be interesting for him, I imagine, being able to really see different places. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, normally he doesn't go off the boat. Yeah. He stays on the boat the whole time. So he never, he never goes off the boat. He's obviously off the boat now and uh, discovering other things to run around and things like that. But um, he, he's been very good, hasn't he? Yeah. He's fallen off four times. Yeah. From the boat into the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that dangerous? Like the, the cat just jumps well, off. Well, once he flipped off the front when we were at anchor, and uh-huh. uh, that was pretty serious because uh, that was over, well, about a two-meter drop, and then he was in a bit of a shock. Uh, he didn't know about that. <laughs> I had to dive in and swim underneath the boat and rescue him. Um, and the other times he's fallen off uh, trying to jump onto a pontoon and uh, or looking at fish over the back, and then he, he sort of puts his foot, and then he, he, he whoops, he goes in. So um, it's uh, it's difficult. Yeah. Ah, that's interesting. A cat on a boat sounds like a also a very fascinating life as well. <laughs> so, what what are some other interesting stories, or what is like a very interesting incident that you guys have had while sailing? I think one of the most wonderful things that we've done is uh, to meet people along the way. Yeah. Um, it it is very easy to meet people uh, because you're all sort of anchored up together. And everybody has their flag at the back, so it's easy to go and find another British boat, for example, and invite people around for a drink. And then um, going ashore in the evenings and uh, having a beach barbecue and chatting oh. with people and uh, things like that is just terribly romantic, yeah. absolutely beautiful. And uh, especially if you're eating fresh fish that you've recently caught, it's uh, absolutely wonderful. Yeah, those are all the sort of good things. The bad things is when it's... Uh, the weather's really rough and mm-hmm. uh, you're just getting, you know, it's, it, it's getting tiring, rough and, uh, and hospitable. We, 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 we went, we were going to Cuba from Mexico and, uh, so we were heading due east, uh, and we were going to go along the north coast of Mex, of, of Cuba and, uh, a, a real blow built up in the Yucatan channel. That's the channel there. It's around about um, 75, 80 miles. And we actually got pushed south. And we ended up having to go back to sea uh, for another day before we reached. And and, uh, we ended up on the south coast of Cuba. And we had to do the whole south coast of Cuba, which we weren't planning on doing, but was absolutely fascinating and and absolutely wonderful. It was an extra thousand miles. Yeah, it was an extra thousand miles. (laughs) (laughs) We go slow and we can be delighted with things. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So sailing seems to really be a life of like go with the flow, right? Whatever the flow brings. Yeah, you, yeah. You have to. You, you, have, have, yeah, to. you yeah. have to. Things yeah. never quite seem to go according to plan. Yeah. And uh, even in the best planning in the world to make a passage work well, it, you still can't really know what's going to happen until you act. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When you're dependent on uh, nature forces, it's always difficult to really have an exact plan and stick to it, right? Well, we came back across the Atlantic from the Caribbean to the, to Europe. Um, we, one of the legs was from Bermuda to the Azores. And it was supposed to take us 12 days. It actually took us 18. Wow. And, and mentally, that's really quite difficult yeah. because you're prepared for kind of 12 days at sea in your mind. Uh, was it 12? Yeah, 12 yeah, days. Yeah, 12 days. 12 days. And, and then you end up staying 18 days. Yeah. And your mind doesn't cope with that no. situation. So you need to, you know, you get really upset and stressed. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's another thing that is not that's, very good. That's interesting. But what about like supplies? Like if you have only packed for like a 12 days journey of food and gas and whatnot. You don't pack for 12 days. Uh, you pack for a lot longer than that. Yeah. And oh. also we, we have a water maker on board. So basically we can't run out of water because we can make water from the ocean. Yeah. Um, Got it. And also we have bottled water and things like that because water is really the biggest one. But food, we, we always have. Yeah. You I know, always, have have to, you know, prepare the boat for like three months, yeah. you know, even if it's a small journey. I reckon it's a lot of canned food and preserved food then rather than fresh food because obviously those can be stored longer. 
Yeah, but we, we take uh, fresh fruit too. Uh, you take vegetables, fruit, and that it, you have to choose better the vegetables. You're not going to choose lots of tomatoes. You're going to choose more uh, bud, butternut squash or something, you know, things that are going to last longer uh, yeah. on your fridge or outside. Um, then the ones that don't. But fruit, uh, fresh fruit and vegetable, you can, you, if you're careful with how you store it, you can get it to last two weeks. Yes, yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I know Carla at least is into healthy food and stuff, right? And obviously you want the greens and vitamins yeah. from the fruit. And how's the crowd like in terms of this kind of lifestyle? Are they more of the older crowd or more of the younger stuff? Because I know van life is getting very popular. A complete spread of people. You, you discover that there's some people sort of in their early 20s living this lifestyle and uh, some of these people aren't they're not wealthy or anything they've got, they've got you know quite an old boat really uh, somehow they've managed to buy that and you can see them really struggling uh, to maintain it and then you get other people who are our age or even older and um, some of them are, you know can be really quite wealthy and they just pay for everything to be fixed on it just totally various um, as you would probably yeah. Mm, got it. And and what are some of the things you guys aim to do when you are traveling per se in terms of the bigger picture, right? When you get to a certain destination, are you more of the outdoorsy type where you go for hiking and stuff? Or do yep. you search more for culture? What do you look for? Well, there isn't really that much culture in the Caribbean, uh, mm -hmm. really. So so most of our, most of our is, is uh, walking or hiking. Um, and we did quite a lot in Colombia, for example, and in Panama and things like that, going up into the mountains and seeing waterfalls and various, you know, jungles and forests and things like that. So, uh, we did quite a lot of walking. You get used to walking in this way, so, because we don't have a car. Yeah. And, uh, so everything you want, whether you want to go to the supermarket or to a post office or anything you want, you have to walk. Uh, and also we, we, when we stop from a journey, so we have to work. Because we work yeah. online, you know, doing our YouTube videos and things. So we need some time to catch up and put everything uh, up to date. Yeah. yeah, got it. And speaking of which, I know you guys started running a YouTube channel, right? And mm -hmm. was this planned or did, did you guys just fall into it? Like decided that, hey, let's just, go, <laughs> let's just film our sailing life. Uh, no, it was always part of the plan because um, really we needed something to do, yeah. um, you know, uh, to, to, you know, Possibly entertain ourselves, but just going from uh, sort of working to doing nothing. Yeah, it was quite scary. So yeah. we just thought yeah. we need to do something. So we need yeah. to start doing something. So we thought we could do a um, uh, sailing channel. So our family, friends, and possibly other people could like him, you know, and see what we were doing. Yeah. And we have been actually very successful. We have uh, loads of subscribers. We have over 4 million views. So yeah, we, we've been uh, doing well from that part. So. It really helps yeah, us. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And uh, we really like the comments that we get as well and interacting with the people, whether yeah. that's on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram, or whichever for, you know, format we do. And I heard you guys actually managed to kind of like get into the monetization requirements of YouTube like within three months of launching the channel, right? 11 weeks, yeah. 11, 11 weeks. weeks, yeah. That's, that's very fast, actually. Like, because I mean, like, you guys didn't leverage on an existing channel that you guys have. It's not like you were already Instagram influencers and then you bring the traffic, right? It was like from scratch. From and scratch. Taking... Everything was from scratch. It's just we did a lot of, um, promotion. Promotion. Yeah. A lot of promotion. Yeah. Not paid promotion. We no. just, I just, you know, learned everything from scratch because we, I, I didn't know anything about Facebook or Instagram or anything. Uh, so I start learning, reading, and doing, experimenting, and just being out there as much as possible. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah, we did quite well with that. Yeah. Yeah. What are some tips and strategies that you guys can share then <laughs> to grow a YouTube channel from scratch? What kind of promotions do you guys do? Uh, we do we do a lot of sharing. Uh, so Simon writes a blog on Facebook every day uh, <laughs> when we are out on the boat. So that blog has a link of our YouTube video on that week uh, that we, um, so in the, then the blog, I will be sharing the blog with, on the groups, the groups that are related to our sailing life. Uh, so I, I share in like 20 groups uh, every day. So I annoy a lot of people. 
<laughs> you know, you've got to be prepared to take the people that go, uh, oh, you can't, you're promoting yourself, you can't do that. And just forget about it, just ignore it, and just keep going. And keep yeah, going. Keep yeah going. You, you need to have a good relationship with the group administrators, so they will let yeah. you, you know, post uh, your things there. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's uh, that's what we mostly we do to do what yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Through Facebook and Instagram, really. Yeah. Yeah. Stories, we do loads of stories every day. I have stories going on on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Everywhere on our personal pages, uh, IGTV, you know, I just, I use all the resources, you know. Yeah, it seems. And having a good uh, thumbnail is a key element as well, too. Yeah. yeah. And putting in all the tags and all the links and linking it all everywhere, yeah. um, it, you know, it, it's not, you can't do it if you put up one video every couple of weeks or something and don't do anything else. Yeah. You're not, you've got to put, you've got to make around like two or three videos a week. For YouTube to start saying, oh, you're doing something. We need to build up yeah. data so YouTube can find you and push you up. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. how we do. So we do around three videos a week. Mm. Uh, and we are doing our podcasts now too. So mm. yes, that's how we do. This, which is a lot of work, as you probably know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's interesting because I believe a lot of people sometimes look at so-called content creators and because they only see the final product, right? And sometimes they think that, you know, that is like very quick work and very easy stuff. But when you really dive into it, you, you realize there's a thousand and one things that needs to be done. Yeah. I do think people appreciate how much work uh, these influencers and content people uh, actually go to to make the free content that they watch. Because yeah. it's... Kind of tiny things that you have to do every single day, all the time. I probably spent about two hours just on promotion of the channel every day. Just has to be done, you know? So once you start, you just do it here, here, here. But it, it, two hours are gone. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's just very time consuming. Uh, yep. yep. I, I love it. I love it. I really like it. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure to do it. Someone likes it too. Yep. Yeah, we've learned lots of skills. Uh, through this, yeah. um, like for example, just uh, video editing and uh, and how to talk to the camera, and uh, you know, apart from the uh, social media skills that we've learned, so yeah, uh, easy. It's, it's been fantastic. Really. It's been you guys, are just, you guys are just picking everything up from scratch and then just diving yeah. into it and learning and just keep yeah. doing. Uh, that's yeah. that just proves that you can do anything you want if you want to do it. Yeah. You just dive into it yeah. and do it. Yeah, yeah. Put your I mean, it's like we had to get back from Spain with all our belongings. So, uh, what most people would do probably is get a, a, an international courier company to take all your belongings back to uh, the UK and probably jump on the, the aircraft and come back. But we decided we would buy uh, a van, uh, a Mercedes Sprinter van, and uh, bring it back to the UK and then convert it into a camper van and sell it. And uh, we, that's what we're planning on doing with the van as soon as we got it unloaded. And that hopefully will pay uh, the cost um, of actually coming back. Well, you see what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. so because we should be able to sell it at a profit once it's been converted. And it's always looking at um, different opportunities and different ways to uh, make a little bit. People love these and, ideas. And it's you know? it yeah. just inspires people to yeah. do things too, yeah. especially in our age because we are not 20 on our 20s so people get really inspired by us and it's very very rewardful when, yeah. when you meet someone and say well i'm here, here at sea because of you i got inspired because of you mm -hmm. so I, I i watched your videos and now i'm here at sea too you know just yeah. uh for a boat and i'm enjoying the life as you are too so it's, it is, uh, it's fantastic yeah. fantastic experience yeah. if anybody's thinking about doing this it's better in reality than it ever looks on video. Yeah. Yeah. That's getting me very intrigued <laughs> about <laughs> trying it out at least, you know. Yeah, but that's true. I mean, like, you guys are pretty inspiring in that sense because not just uh, in terms of, like, the way you travel, but even on the part of, like, just picking up stuff that you want to do and just producing content and stuff because, like, for me, to be honest, I think I come from an advantageous position whereby I have the technical background, I have a design background, so like creating websites and whatever is already not like a difficult thing for me. But of course, then it comes the hard work of like, you know, you need to, need to go and engage on social media and all those kind of stuff. And like, it just makes it like a lot more of like effort that you need to put in. So yeah. those, like seeing you guys do it actually makes me feel like, you know, I should put in more effort to do more of this kind of stuff. Yeah. 
Speaking of which, we were talking just now about working on the boat, right? And I'm sure Wi-Fi is an issue, especially when you are dealing with video files that are like, you know, huge yeah. sizes. So how do you guys kind of balance between, you know, working and sailing? Uh, it was a nightmare, to be honest, uh, rega- regarding uh, Wi-Fi, wasn't it? Well, Wi-Fi is always a big problem. Um, big problem. Because and in the end, uh, we, we came down to the reality that we have to buy local SIM cards and, yeah. uh, you know, the ones which have unlimited amounts of data. Um, and it may be that they'd be they'd last 10 days and we have to replace them or refill them. And that really is, and pretty well most places, um, uh, they're pretty cheap, really. Yeah. yeah. But at the beginning, we start going to coffee shops to yeah. just upload the videos. And then we realized that we were spending more money in coffees and anything, yeah. you know, in the coffee shop than yeah. buying a SIM card. Yeah. So we realized now we're going to have to buy a SIM card and uh, yeah. to do things properly. But in, in then, then you have problems with the signal. The signal is not good yeah. everywhere. So sometimes you found this find this beautiful bay where you got anchor, everything is perfect, and then you get your phone. No, no, no signal. signal. And you have to move, because if yeah. you have to upload the video, you have to yeah. move. So what we learned to was just be ahead. So we had to always be ahead like three, four weeks. So we didn't stress with mm-hmm. that situation. Mm-hmm. So we had to do a lot of work to try to be ahead, because it's a lot of work to try to be ahead, have like three, four videos up all the time. So then uh, Cuba was very difficult because oh, there's yeah. basically there's no uh, very limited GSM uh, yeah. service, so you have to hotspot everywhere, yeah. and you can only buy a token for an hour, yeah. and uh, so you're forever trying to buy tokens. And uh, so slow. <laughs> that's the thing I heard about Cuba because I wanted to visit, but they were saying like there's only like certain areas where you can get, and you'll go to maybe a park and you'll see like a whole bunch of people just sitting at the park using their phones because yeah. that's the only area where the reception is good enough. A square in the village is a typical example. Yeah, yeah everybody's just sitting around in a square in the village using the local free wi Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, uh, that tends to be uh, yeah. how they do. Yeah. It's yeah. partly due to the fact that they can monitor the Wi-Fi much easier than they can monitor the mobile phone. And uh, when we went into Cuba, uh, they did say, they, you know, um, take our satellite phone with us, uh, which in fact they didn't do. Anything. Got it. And so in that case, what is the pace of travel for you guys? Because you need to factor in work. And also, I reckon if you spend a whole day doing paperwork for the boat and for entry, you also wouldn't want to just leave after spending a whole day on paperwork, right? So how, how often do you stick around for at a certain place? And if, for example, we spend seven weeks in uh, Aruba, uh, but we only spent uh, 24 hours in um, Dominica. Uh, it, it depends it how we like the place. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. we like the place, we if stay. If we like yeah. the place, we stay. Uh, there is some bounds, bang- some, some boundaries, isn't it? Because yeah. of the weather, you need to mm-hmm. you need to worry about certain c- certain places. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you, you have something called the hurricane season, uh, yeah. which in June to uh, November in the Caribbean. And so you have to make sure you're out of what they call the hurricane zone or the hurricane box. And for us, that meant going down to uh, the ABC Islands, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao, then Colombia and Panama. And uh, by the time we'd done that, we then were able to go back into the box and go up to um, Grand Cayman and Mexico. So uh, you have to sort of kind of plan your route around those sort of things as well. Yeah. Oh, so it's still, as I hear, it's still a lot around just natural forces, right? But in terms of work and stuff, you guys still have the freedom to basically do quite a lot of things based on your own schedule and liking. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, you, wouldn't go, you wouldn't go across the Atlantic Ocean any time of the year. You know, you would pick uh, the months of the year to go, which are the best months, which would typically be sort of going from east to west would be sort of... Uh, December, January, February time would be the best time to go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so what are your plans now in terms of like when you sail? Are there certain things you look out for or you just go wherever you want to go? Uh, no, we, 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 look, we look for the weather, the, the weather window, the best time to go. Uh, make sure that the wind is behind us because that's a much easier way to sail than mm-hmm. uh, go into the wind. And uh, if it means you have to wait somewhere, then you have to wait somewhere. Yeah. Um, that's basically Sometimes you get stuck in places just waiting for a week, yeah. two weeks. You have to wait for yeah. the wind to come, yeah. the right wind to take you somewhere. Mm-hmm. Got it. 
And so to conclude, for anyone that wants to start living this lifestyle, right? What are some of the tips that you have? And are there certain equipments that you guys have realized along the way that is like often overlooked, but actually turn out to be really useful in a boat life? First, that's some training because it's very yeah. important. I mean, <laughs> I never failed before we went on this journey, but Simon has boat since he was 10 years old. So he, he is a good sailor. So he knows what he's doing. Uh, so first start to get some training. It's important. And make sure you've got all the correct safety equipment on board. Um, that's probably the next most important thing. Yeah. Because if you fall off the boat, you, you, you don't want to be left in the water on your own. Uh, you, you've got to have a system whereby, uh, by satellite or whatever, you can get the boat and come back to you and find you. So that's really quite a sort of important thing. And then after that, I would say that the next most important thing is uh, generating enough uh, electricity and uh, having more electricity than you possibly need. Uh, we didn't have enough solar panels on our boat, really. You know, we, we did struggle with generating enough from time to time. But it sounds like you guys are pretty well prepared sailors, you know, that like you just have backup for almost everything that you can before you set off. Yeah, we had to. <laughs> That's nice. Cool. Thank you guys for coming on today. So where can people find you, basically, if you want to know more about your story? What are the channels you guys are on and how do we find you? So you can find us at uh, .com, it's which is our website. Uh, apart from that, we have a very consistent brand, which is always Sailing Ocean Fox in all the social media, YouTube, Sailing, o Sailing Ocean Fox, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And LinkedIn. Yeah, Sailing Ocean Fox everywhere, guys. <laughs> Cool, yeah, that's simple enough to remember. And I know you guys used to offer, when you have the boat, you guys used to offer onboard experience of sailing with yeah, the guys, right? That's correct, yes. Is that going to happen with the new... new it will do. Uh, once the barge, if big, huge barge is up and running, we will be offering yep, barging experiences uh, for people that want to come and spend a week with us uh, cruising along uh, the rivers. Sounds good. Thank you guys for coming on today. Thank you for listening to Chat with Nomads. Please remember to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And be sure to share with your friends. Also, we'd love to know what topics you'd like to hear more about. To stay updated on the latest, join us on our mailing list at chatwithnomads.com. You can also find more travel and nomading tips at Nomads Unveiled. That's N-O-M-A-D-S. U-N-V-E-I-L-E-D dot com. Start living your dreams today. We'll catch